All right, well, I'm going to welcome everyone to the November 20th. Oh, yeah. Thank you. To the November 20th uh, Community Resources Meeting. I'm the chair, Gary Perry. Laura, would you take a roll call? Sure. Councillor Perry. Here. Councillor Elvin. Here. Councillor Jarrett. Here. 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 All right. Well, we have a quorum here. And before we get started, I just want to let everyone know that this meeting is being audio and video recorded. Um, and that takes us to public comment. Is there anyone who would like to make a public comment? I don't see anyone in the room, but if you are on Zoom and would like to make a comment, you can raise your hand either virtually or physically. Seeing none. We will move on. And we've got the minutes of October 16th to approve. Looking for a motion. Move to approve. Second. And we can take a voice vote. All those in favor. Aye. 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 All <laughs> those. That's nay. Or abstentions. Nope. That's everyone. Perfect. Uh, do we have any updates or announcements in this fine committee? of the fact that it's almost the holidays. So thank you guys for making time to come, uh, which brings us to our main thing. We're so lucky to have our representative, Lindsay Savadopsi here to just kind of check in with us. We were had the pleasure of having uh, Senator Comerford here, Comerford here for our last meeting. And so uh, we are looking forward to just continuing some dialogue with you. So I will open the floor to you. So would you like me to start with like a little bit of a legislative update or do you just want to do questions and answers? I'm happy to do whatever the committee would like. I think an update would be excellent. Okay. Well, uh, we are now after uh, November 15th. So we have entered a phase of the legislature that is the end of our first year, moving into our second. So we won't be having any more formal sessions until uh, the first Wednesday in January. So it's a little bit of a, a quiet time in terms of major pieces of legislation moving, but a very busy time for smaller pieces of legislation moving. So happy to announce one of the things that happened today was the legislation that Northampton asked for regarding the liquor licenses passed the Senate. So that's going to be very quickly coming back to the House. Uh, it was engrossed by both the House and the Senate. It has to be enacted, but that is pretty much a formality at this point. All of the difficulties have been worked out. Um, as you know, or as I think you know, the House changed the legislation a little bit based on how the Home Rule petition was sent to us. So we've, we've kept the mayor's office up to date, but um, there's just been some conversation in the Commonwealth about how how we handle liquor licenses and within which districts they can be issued. So the legislation now reflects that, but Northampton is going to be getting seven additional liquor licenses to be distributed in the community. And we're hoping that that will get to the governor's desk. Let's keep our fingers crossed and say by the end of the month, but certainly within by the end of the year. So, um, so th that's exciting. We have a few more pieces of legislation that are moving through that Northampton has requested. Um, most particularly, we have the legislation around Forbes Library. So expanding the number of trustees, that's moving into third reading. So you'll see that coming to you or coming back to you rather in the next few weeks. Um, and then other Northampton things would be the uh, legislation regarding the Northampton Housing Authority having um, and leaving its management agreement with the Hilltown Properties and becoming officially the uh, the property owner of those, which is really done uh, for a lot of reasons, but namely because uh, there was no ability to hire an executive director in the Hilltowns. Uh, those properties are very, very tiny and very small, and Northampton's been managing them for several years. So this will facilitate some of the financial conversations around those properties, um, and that will be coming uh, back as well in the next few weeks. Was there a question? No. Okay, sorry. I <laughs> just... Um, so those are some of the, the smaller pieces. The House um, most recently finished several really large pieces of legislation, many of which will have a significant impact on the city. Um, I probably heard about the tax reform package, but I'm happy to go into details if anybody wants to discuss that a little bit more. I don't want to be redundant. Um, I'll talk about bills that the House only has done thus far, um, and the one that's taken up the most oxygen has really been gun reform. Um, so that has was the result of 11 listening sessions around the Commonwealth, fo followed by four different drafts of the bill. The goal is really to update our laws um, and to have some of the strongest and toughest gun laws in the nation. And if the bill passes the Senate, uh, that that is where we will be. Um, and that bill 
took a lot of wrangling to get the votes and to get everybody on board with it. So um, we passed that uh, back in October. After that, we moved on to long-term care. That's been another priority of the House. We saw during the pandemic how stressful and difficult it was to maintain long-term care facilities. And then we experienced the closure of three nursing homes in Western Massachusetts, which has led to panic um, in the hospitals because they can't release um, they can't release patients who are ready to step down because there is no place for them to go. Um, and so we are trying to make it a little bit easier for DPH to understand when a long-term care facility is in financial crisis so that they can step in sooner. And we want it to be easier for hospitals to release patients. So we're doing a trial uh, run around the pre-authorization that is generally required to get patients out of hospitals and into long-term care beds. So that bill uh, also took up a lot of time Time and energy, it had to move through elder cares as well as healthcare financing. So when you have multiple committees involved and lots of bills piled into one, it takes up a fair bit of, of time. But in the spring, the legislature has made a commitment to looking at health care more broadly. Um, I know the Senate recently passed a pharmaceutical uh, price reduction bill. The House may take that up. The House is also looking at trying to prevent the consolidation of hospitals and to maintain community hospitals, uh, which is something that I think we've all noticed, even if we don't, if even if it doesn't spark a light bulb immediately, you notice that there are more urgent care facilities where you go to because it's harder and harder to get into your primary care doctor because your primary care doctor is no longer a private practice. And so we're trying to figure out how we stop that. It's particularly poignant in Western Massachusetts where wait lists to get in to see the doctor, if, you, if you're if you a new patient, can be hundreds of people ahead of you in line. Um, and so that is our big goal for the spring to get that taken care of. Um, and it's been a goal for several years. So we're hoping that it will actually cross the finish line this time. On the financial front, um, you know, we're headed into consensus revenue conversations to figure out where the state of the Commonwealth is going. Right now, it's not amazing, um, to just be really blunt. So we are about $350 million off of our benchmark. So that would be what we expect to take in as revenue. We haven't taken it in. That means that we're getting a little, we're, we're, we're worried, we're not panicking, um, but we're trying, we're hoping that the holiday sales season will be a good one and that we'll see a little bit more spending. The problem right now is that we don't, have just one thing that's wrong. So some months it's that revenues are a little bit less. Some months sales are off. We can't quite pinpoint what is ailing our economy, but we know something is there. And what's interesting is Massachusetts is the only state in New England that is seeing our numbers off benchmark. And our benchmark was pretty conservative. Um, so we're going into consensus revenue hearings now. That's when we sort of decide what we think the economy is going to do for next year. And then we base the budget off of that. Now, I know you will all tell me how frustrating budgeting is with the way the Commonwealth, uh, the legislature works with the budget. And I know you need your budgets out before ours, which makes it impossible. But I think what we are um, comfortable saying right now is we're a little worried. Um, that there might be cuts in the upcoming year. And we're hoping that isn't the case, uh, but the governor's office is prepping for that and we're prepping as well. Um, so something that we're all keeping our eye on. I don't like to be the bearer of bad news, but I do want to be realistic and let you know what's what's going on. Um, so those, I think, are the primary things um, that are happening. And um, I'm happy to answer questions or, or have engaged on any of those points. If that's yeah, okay. uh, counselors, do you have any questions? Wait. Um, could you just give us a brief overview of the tax reform? Sure. So the tax reform um, is is a very large package, and the goal it was really one of the governor's priorities. Her argument is that we needed to do some sort of tax reform in order to make the Commonwealth more competitive, although part of the tax reform package really started before she was even elected. There were things that the House and Senate had both agreed to doing, um, particularly around helping some of the most vulnerable people in the Commonwealth. 
Um, and so that would have been things, or that includes things like the earned income tax credit, deductions for dependents, um, the uh, rental tax deduction, and then the senior circuit breaker, which is my favorite because it's a refundable deduction. So even if you don't owe anything in taxes, you can still get money back. And that's for senior citizens who pay rent or a mortgage, they're able to take some money off of their taxes for that. So those were things we had agreed on before when the governor, uh, I should say, but all got stymied because they were in the economic development bill. And then if you recall, um, there was the great announcement about 62F that our revenues because of federal funding had hit such a point that all of a sudden we triggered a tax law that nobody remembered from 1984 and so had to send money back to taxpayers. Because of that, we um shelved a lot of the economic development bill and waited until the next uh, fiscal year. So we got all of those tax reforms through. The governor asked for several others, though, um, that she labeled as things that would help the Commonwealth be more competitive. Um, those were probably, if we're going to label things progressive or non-progressive, those were probably some of the least progressive taxes because they encouraged business. Um, so I don't actually have a problem with a lot of them. I just want to make sure that people know that. Um, the ones that went directly to residents were about 700 million and then 300 million are sort of these competitive business taxes. Um, they included uh, the single sales factor, single sales factor tax, which makes bookkeeping easier for businesses. That's something other states around us do. And so the argument was if other states are doing it, we should do this as well to encourage a business to be in Massachusetts as opposed to Connecticut or Rhode Island or New Hampshire. Um, there was also the capital gains tax, which um, was probably the one that I got the most sort of pushback around. We did lower our capital gains tax, not as low as the governor wanted, um, but we've lowered it. We are completely out of line with our neighboring states, and that is partly why I would, if I if I get to be on my soapbox for a minute, I would also argue um, when you saw Silicon Valley Bank almost implode over the summer, it really... Um, shrunk the venture capital market in Massachusetts, which drives a lot of our biotech industry and the short-term capital gains rate plays a really pivotal role in deciding where to locate and whether to hold buildings or sell them. And so I can see the governor's point in saying that that rate played a, a role in our competitiveness. Um, and then there was also the estate tax. So the estate tax is really interesting. Um, Massachusetts is one of, I believe, 10 states that has an estate tax. I might be wrong. It might be 12, but still a handful. We had the lowest threshold for residents paying the estate tax than any other state besides Oregon. Um, so like, for example, New York, I think is 5 million. Vermont is 3 million. Rhode Island is like 1.9. Um, so we were asking residents to pay more or, or descendants to pay more because obviously the person who passes away doesn't pay it. Their their heirs do. Uh, so we were trying to get a little more in line with that, um, with what other states are doing, but we still maintain that. We now have a $2 million threshold as opposed to one. So those were key components. Um, but there were also lots of other taxes in there, like to try to make our hard cider more competitive, uh, by adjusting that rate, there was um, taxes for septic systems. So lots of uh, not particularly sexy things, but important for the businesses that they affected. Yeah. Oh, if I could ask one more. Um, sure. The housing bond. Bill, yes. Um, specifically, how do you see how that could affect Northampton or this area? So... The housing bond is really difficult to predict right now. And I know that there's been a lot of press about what the governor filed. Um, I think it's safe to say that the legislature plans on changing that significantly. Um, so I would view that all as a starting point and take the things that you like and you don't like. And then the hearing for that will be in January. Um, and we'll be working through it. It's going to take a few months for that to move forward because there are, I believe, 29 individual pieces of policy within an enormous bond bill. Um, and those bills are all before different committees in the legislature. So all of those committees will weigh in in some way as to whether they should move forward. And the governor has, in some respects, changed what some of those ideas or, or bills said. So um, I think it my hope is that we'll have a significant impact on Northampton. Um, we brought Secretary Augustus out 
a few weeks ago now and brought him to some of the projects in Northampton. And I'm actually very excited to say, um, and I'm not, I'm not, this is not a spoiler alert, but um, the Prospect Place project just got a $2 million grant for the green energy that they're going to be using. And I get to go to that award ceremony tomorrow. So we're happy to bring the secretary out and kind of grease the wheels on some of the things that we'd like to see happen in Northampton, um, including the project that will be just right next door. And of course, the Resilience Hub. So I'm hoping the bond bill will include all of those things as well as um, greater... <sighs> Anything that helps makes it a little bit easier to build affordable housing. Uh, we're really trying to make sure that the secretary hears that from the developers in the area. Yeah. And are, will there be opportunities for Northampton to advocate? Absolutely. Yes. I mean, my hope is that we will be able to put projects for Northampton and surrounding communities into the bill. Um, that's generally what happens with bond bills. They're authorizations. The governor then has to approve them. But that's why it's even more important that the administration knows what they are ahead of time. So we can maybe jump the line a little bit. Great. Yeah. Let us know when. Absolutely. Opportune time. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Can you give a little bit of update? Um, I know Councilor Jared and I, I know uh, we're informal here. Rachel <laughs> um, uh, also uh, has worked on some sustainability and environmental issues. Yes. Can you give us just a brief update on kind of what's moving and shaking? So there, there's a couple things that are moving and shaking. There's some actually very good news. If you follow the inner workings of the legislature, you might know that the TUE committee, the, uh, let's see if I can remember what TUE stands for, Telecom Utilities and Energy, uh, has had some drama this session. The House and the Senate have been having separate hearings. Uh, yes. The chairs are now speaking to each other and they are working together and they are trying to report out bills. Now, what they report out exactly is still anybody's guess there. I know I certainly have a list of things I've been pushing for, um, but I will say that's a very good sign. They've talked a lot about wanting to do a larger omnibus bill again. And so, and I think that's probably how you're going to see energy bills move forward. It's just really, it's really hard to do a lot of standalone bills because then you have to go through the amendment process and people get upset about certain things. Why this bill, not that one. So the larger bills do seem to be the way to go. It seems to be what House and Senate leadership like. So things are moving on that front. Um, in the supplemental budget that we are still waiting to see passed, uh, we did... Um, put in provisions to facilitate the transmission lines from Quebec. So those that's the hydropower that's coming down that's been held up for quite a while. That will have an enormous effect on the Commonwealth if it comes to fruition. Um, and then the other thing to watch out for, and we don't have an exact date because it's up to the governor when she files it, but we are expecting an environmental bond bill to come forward because we're at that reauthorization point. Those come out every five years. So that's something that will happen in the spring. So we should have at least two opportunities to affect climate policy in the next um, in the next year of this session. Um, yeah. Follow up. Sure. On that. Um, so I saw an article about changes need coming or needed to mass save. Oh, yes. And uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, I've certainly heard that people have had a difficult, confused. It's very confusing what the incentives mm -hmm. are and how to get them. And yeah. um, <clears throat> is that something you're so, th yes, I filed legislation around it, although I will say the piece of legislation that I filed is um, more out of frustration than anything because of the constituent calls I get and the way those rebates are calculated for people who are self-employed versus people who are employed uh, or not for self-employed versus what is the right word? Working for somebody else. There we go. Um, so it, it, it can be very challenging because self-employed people, they don't let you... Um, they base it on your gross income and not on your net, whereas the other way around, they always base it on your net because I don't know why, but that's the way the formula works. So we're trying to fix that. But I will say um, we've heard a ton from the TUE community about mass save and wanting to make that easier. And we've heard it from the administration too. So if I were a betting person, which I am not, I would bet that it would end up in an omnibus bill. Right. Um, so if you have more ideas about that, please write to me. But I think everybody in Northampton has written to me about how Mass Save has been hard to work with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Feel free. <laughs> yeah. Uh, kind of related. Um, I, I've concerned you, we, my experience with community action just personally has been so incredible. 
Uh, it's not that mass saves, you know, wasn't a, an interesting visit, yeah. but I just got um, much more, you know, practical, you know, straightforward help from community action. I'm just curious because I heard that the governor was thinking of or was playing on some cuts with community actions or some consolidations. And I, I think it would be a shame if we lose too much of their um, on the ground power. Well, the legislature agreed with you. The governor did veto uh, funding for community action, but we restored it. Oh, I didn't hear the good news part of that. So we restored it on multiple fronts. Uh, the governor had vetoed uh, money for just for their operations. So really that on the ground help that yeah. you're talking about. And we restored that. We also restored the rate increases for um, the Head Start program that community action runs. That's fantastic. That's really good news. Yeah. Because to me, I don't know, you know, I, I mean, community action might vary across the street, but in Western Mass, it's kind of, to me, a model of what good government looks like, yeah. you know in terms of helping folks. So that's really good news. Yeah. Um, I had another not related question if you, okay. Well, I was, I, we, I brought this up with uh, the Senator too, but I'm just curious about your perspective with home rule petitions, <laughs> you know, because counselors love to, to pursue them because yes. our constituents often want things that are based, frankly, a little beyond our, you know, given power. But I was just curious, like what you thought about the rate, you know, the, how many were, thrown at you. I, I'm keen to wear its work for you. Um, I'm just curious about that, pro how you feel about that process when we bring you things. <laughs> um, I do think, having spoken frequently to the chair of third reading, that I am one of the top 10 at the very least legislators with the most home rule petitions. So congratulations. <laughs> uh, you know, I think some of them are challenging. Uh, and we know that the committee chairs will say that. Um, but I do think that a lot of legislation we file is also putting a stake in the ground about where our values are on a particular issue. We know that not every bill we file is going to pass. I mean, that, that'd be lovely. But, you know, we file a lot and we can only accomplish so much in a session and you do need consensus to pass anything. So I think that sometimes these petitions, as as well as legislation that I file or any other legislator files, is sort of like a placeholder for when that topic comes up. Um, so I, I was saying this today, I, I did an interview about criminal justice reform, and I said, like, I know that not every bill I've filed is going to pass, but there will be the day that we're going to do this omnibus bill on criminal justice. And then a lot of these bills will be able to be included in that because their time will be right. So I don't think that the home rule petitions are are a bad thing. I don't mind doing the work for them. Um, just so long as everyone understands, not every single one is going to pass every time. Um, you know, some of them are much easier than others. But for example, um, allowing undocumented immigrants to vote, the Secretary of State's office has written back with large highlighted circles around the Constitution and just said no. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's a bad thing to file. Other communities have done it, too. It means that there's interest in conversation. And at least once a year, that conversation gets to come up at the State House. Thank you. Yes, okay. Council Bolton. following up on that, uh, uh, the two others of that nature that I have a particular interest in, ranked choice voting and vote 16, um, I wonder if you could give us your assessment of potential movement on those next year. So the ranked choice voting bill is the one that got the closest last time, um, and it was really down to the wire on the very last day of session, we had a redraft from the committee and then they just decided they weren't going to do it. Um, it's been harder. Uh, we had some ranked choice voting bills pass in 2019 or maybe the early days of 2020. Uh, but then we have a new speaker who is not particularly a fan of ranked choice voting. Northampton's petition is asking for permission to have a referendum on the issue, which makes it a little bit different. Um, we certainly had that conversation with the committee again. We, The speaker understood it last session, um, but it does get hard when lots of communities are asking and their petitions all look a little bit different and people at the last minute do sort of wonder why one bill is moving if theirs is not, and that can um, stop everything. It's much easier to say no than it is to say yes. For vote 16, uh, our 
petition moved further than than any other. So I'm very proud of that. And I take no credit. It is entirely because of the Youth Commission who comes in and is regularly wonderful uh, in meeting with the, the chair of the committee and other legislators. Um, they are very compelling in their arguments. I think the idea has been around for a long time. Um, we actually, at the when the Youth Commission came in this year, the chair of Ways and Means was walking by, and so I introduced them, and he said, oh, that bill was before my committee when I was chairman of it. Um, so at least he was familiar. Um, I think, you know, we keep hearing there are privacy concerns. I know that the city clerk has worked hard to assuage those fears. I think we'll get there eventually. I'm not sure it will be this session, but we will get there eventually. That's, was that a Councilor Molson? Yes. Okay. Um, I have a couple questions. Sure. Um, one is, you know, as you know, near and dear to my heart is just the artist and entertainment community. And I, um, I, I know that the Mass Cultural Council gave out some grants, yeah. someone like 50 million, 51 million, I think. They got, they had more money from the state this year than in any other year prior. Which is awesome. Uh, but, but a lot of that was pandemic relief funding. At, or... Fair amount of it was, um, as you know, pandemic relief funding is, is fungible. So things have uh, moved in different directions. So uh, I guess my question is that um, while some of the funding and grants is, is great, I, I think is there a long-term plan to help out with these industries, especially because uh, while food and and hotel uh, revenue has in, increased and kind of bounced back, um, my understanding is that a lot of the venues are still struggling, and so are artists. And for me, there's a connection between you know artists trying to to, to live. You know, yeah. not a lot of affordable housing, but there's also um, a lack of, of places to play yep. and make a living. So, I was wondering if you guys have thought about that. So. I, I don't have, I, I wish I had a magic wand answer for you. I don't have a magic wand answer, but I was at a venue this morning where we were discussing that, that I think they were saying attendance was down about 25 to 30%. And that feels like it's kind of across the board um, in terms of who's going back to cultural events, to shows, whatever that might be. Um, I don't know that we have figured out how to get people back in. And I think there's also been a little bit of a mindset shift about how people are going out and what they're deciding to see and do. Uh, some people are still not comfortable going out in all, all honesty. We, we hear that from people. Um, but I think some people are also just staying home and streaming Netflix, which is a, a bit of a problem when it comes to having a vibrant local economy. So some of the things that the state is doing, I don't know if you saw Mass Cultural Council, is has started this new campaign about culture being part of healthcare. So you can get a prescription to cultural events because you leave your house. It helps reduce isolation. It's good for everybody. Um, so that's something. And one of the ideas that has been um, that is out there right now. Um, there are, we're headed into the uh, 250th for Massachusetts, which may not seem related, but the whole idea is like, how do we get people re-engaged in culture and celebrate this anniversary in like new and unique ways? So you're seeing museums engage in different types of um, activities. In fact, we just posted this afternoon, in case anybody's interested, you can send loose leaf tea that they will dump into the harbor um, on the 16th. Not joking, like school kids across the state can do this. Um, um, so, yes, it's a little gimmicky, but it is a way to sort of like get people aware of what's happening and try to get them out of the house and involved. And I think it starts to roll, right? Like when you're like, oh, going to that was really fun. What's the next fun thing I can do? It's it's really start about working that muscle again. So, I mean, I think there are lots of things like that that we can do, ways that we can be creative to get people back out into venues. But I don't think we have a, a silver bullet quite yet. Uh, and then my other question was, you know, I, you talked a lot about um, some of the priorities that the legislation had, but I was wondering if there are any particular issues that you were excited about. Uh, and if there was, I think Councillor Jarrett kind of mentioned this, or ways that we can help move things along. Yes. So I do have an issue that I'm pretty passionate about. Uh, so the bill that I'm spending a lot of time on this session is actually around health data privacy. So not the health information that you might share with your doctor or your dentist or your therapist or whoever it is, but the type of information that you're sharing with your cell phone or with your computer and that is not covered by HIPAA. 
um, and that can be sold or shared without your permission because there are no laws to prevent that. And so what we're seeing is um, information being sold very, very cheaply. So for example, one of the researchers we're working with the other day was able to buy health data about veterans, uh, finding out uh, whether they had Alzheimer's, whether they had liver conditions, all their names, their addresses, their phone numbers, their condition for 22 cents, right? Thousands of veterans information could be bought from a data broker for 22 cents. Now, our bill obviously can't stop all of that because we are not the federal government, but we can allow Massachusetts residents to have the option to stop the selling and sharing of their data and to request its cancellation. And if you imagine how dangerous that could be if someone in your house has Alzheimer's and their information is sold or shared, it's really easy to catch somebody like that in a scam, right? Um, And it only gets worse from there. Um, Data brokers have been buying rape victims' information in order to target ads to them um, to sell that information. So that is what I'm working on this session. Um, It's an act relative to consumer health data, and it's H386. And I only know that because I've called colleagues all afternoon asking them to co-sponsor it. Awesome. Thank you. And is there anything we could do to help you? Um... Yes. I mean, if, if the city council wanted to to send in a letter of support or to to do something of that ilk, um, the bill is before uh, consumer protections. So we're we're happy for any and all support. Um, yeah. Oh, I was just going to say we extend it and, and, you know, and you helped usher Councilor Jared and I, uh, Alex and I through um, some testimony and um, uh, and I would just say again, Truly, I mean, we can keep an eye on it, but also, I, you know, I will send it. Happy, yeah. And, well, and also, you know, specifically, like, if, if an actual, you know, person signing onto the Zoom or, um, you know, whatever is is most effective, I, I'm sure almost every, I think probably somebody will be interested in in, in what you're doing and um and see the connection to the city. Yeah. Um. So please hit us up. Absolutely. Yeah, I just uh, had a follow up question. So that's that's separate from um, legislation and concerns around reproductive health of seekers. It, it's not really no. separate at all, quite honestly. Um, you know, part of the impetus for the bill was really around reproductive health care and um, organizations that uh, purport to offer reproductive health care but collect data that they then sell. So the legislation protects anyone in the state of Massachusetts, whether or not they're a Massachusetts resident. So if you're from out of state and you're here, the legislation would cover you. Oh, that's great. Any other questions, comments? No. Well, thank you so much for coming and and spending some time with us. I know that we extended to Senator Comerford that, you know, I, I, I really enjoy getting uh, some insight into what you guys are doing. So if we could make this a thing that happens fairly regularly, it would be nice. Of and, course. Or maybe not, you know, time permitting. Sure. But, uh, we'll be in touch for that. Absolutely. Thank you. Oops. Yeah, I just want to say thank you. Thanks. So, uh, I feel so well represented and we're so lucky to have this kind of access and transparency in our city and with our legislators. And I'm really impressed with the kind of time that you give us. Thank you. Can I just add one thing? Could I just make sure that it's written into the record that I believe it's Council Mayor's birthday tomorrow? Um, Me and just in case anybody wanted to say happy birthday. I won't approve the minutes unless they're in there. Yes. <laughs> happy birthday. Yeah. Thank you. I love it. And again, thank you for time. And thank you for all the things that you do for our city. I know that you do a lot um, fundraising and things like that. A wonderful dancer. but again thank you perfect uh moving to the next item it's items referred to the committee there's none and i don't think we have any new business so in here let's move to adjourn to some turkey yes (laughs) soon Second, oh, second, perfect. And we take this one. <laughs> they have all to meet them. It's not supposed to be any discussion on a German, but we can't get to the second. <laughs> all those in favor. Aye. 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 Yay. Aye. Thank you. <laughs>